Well, I want to welcome everyone to our Easter service once again. Welcome to all of our friends and family and visitors. We are very glad that you're here. Um, and just one more time, he is risen. So like a rapper, or like in the way I used to be. When I say hip, you say hop. Okay, no, that wouldn't, that wouldn't work. Well, uh, this is Easter Sunday, and this is the day that we, uh, that we celebrate the triumph of the resurrection of once again this joyous turn um, that we read in our gospel reading this morning the hope unlooked for the, uh, the unlooked for triumph of our lord jesus christ as he conquered death and the grave um, this is certainly a highlight of the christian year for or of, of the year for us a highlight of the christian calendar uh, the very pinnacle of our um, of our existence of our life as a church in in christ now don't be deceived. Uh, you know, I know I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of stuffy Presbyterian you might know who are quick to point out that every Lord's Day is is Resurrection Sunday, and I celebrate Easter every Sunday. Um, and so there's a in some circles, some people, some people might might uh, poo poo the celebration a bit. And they did have a point to some extent because very clearly as the as the New Testament unfolds, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ does come to take a central place uh, in our lives. It is indeed something that we consider week in and week out, and hopefully for many of us, uh, day by day as well. The resurrection of Christ can't be confined to just an annual holiday like today, um, but days like today are good for special reminder to help shake us out of maybe some of our apathy or what feels like a bit of a routine. Uh, since the beginning of the church's foundation, the resurrection was central to the, to the establishment of the church, the teaching of the apostles, uh, the witness of all Christians as they went out um, evangelizing and transforming the ancient world. As C.S. Lewis correctly observed at one point, he says, he says, in the earliest days of Christianity, an apostle was first and foremost a man who claimed to be an eyewitness of this resurrection. Uh, to preach Christianity meant primarily to preach the resurrection. The resurrection is the central theme in every Christian sermon recorded in the book of Acts. And the resurrection and its consequences, in summary, were the gospel or the good news which the Christians brought. Well, this Easter Sunday morning, we're going to uh, very briefly, this is not going to be a marathon sermon, but so very, very briefly, but consider why that is the case. Consider the significance of this central event in the grand history of redemption, the history of the world, truly. We want to consider why this day of all days is very much so deserving of a true holiday. So we're going to go through that um, over the course of three quick points, uh, the first of which is point number one, uh, the history of the empty tomb. I want to first examine this history of the empty tomb. Put simply, we're going to begin this morning by reviewing the description of, of the events on the day of resurrection as we read them from Mark chapter 16, verses 1. Through 11. These are the events that take place on Resurrection Sunday. Now, very simply, just to, re just to give us a brief uh, recap, what's going on here is there are three women who have appeared at various parts of the, of the gospel. Um, a few different Marys, so that can be confusing. There's Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, um, and this woman named Salome. They all are recorded as having bought spices at one point in time, and they're bringing those spices early on Sunday morning at sunrise to the tomb of Jesus. And there's a few reasons that, that are simple to point out for this. Um, Saturday, um, between Friday and Saturday, was, was the notion of the Jewish, uh, the Jewish Sabbath, and so they were not permitted to do any work, and this type of anointing of Jesus' body would have constituted work, so, so that is why they didn't, you know, they waited until the, the next available moment where they could, which would have been sunrise on Sunday, and what they were doing with this, well, with these spices, is is also very simple. Um, Jewish practice then had no had no notion of of embalming or preservation of a corpse, and so they were taking these spices to go to the tomb 
so that they could anoint the body of Christ uh, and cover the smell of corruption or of, of decaying flesh. There was no expectation of these women that, um, that they would find anything other than the body or the dead body of the Lord at the tomb. They are very clearly in the passage, uh, women who are in grief, and there's a bit of desperation and despondency at work there. I'm not sure if you if you caught it. They don't really have a clear plan of how they're how they're going to get to the body of Christ, because there's this matter of a, a huge stone. So like they go and buy spices, they rush over without a plan of how they're going to get into the tomb at all. They say, hey, there's a there's a one glaring problem here. We don't we, we don't know how we're going to get the stone removed. Um, to get inside, it was it was one that was quite heavy. So obviously, uh, once they arrive, they are in a bit of shock because they find that that large stone had already been set aside. Um, and if that was a shock, when they rush in, there are two other things that they notice that that are quite surprising. The first is that that body that they plan to um, to anoint with spices and to help cover the smell of decaying flesh, well. The body's not there. In addition to that, there's what appears to be a young man sitting, waiting for them. He's dressed in, in all white, and his appearance is described very simply by the term translated alarming. I mean, he's a, he's a shocking presence to go and see. I mean, it's on the one hand shocking to just go into the tomb and see some random dude in there, but it's not simply because he's, he's a rando. It's because of the way that he looks. Uh, that he is in this blazing white apparel, this this, and he's um, he's astonishing in the way that he looks. Now he understands that it's a surprise for the women to see him there. And he, the first thing he says, he tries to give them com- give, give them comfort. Don't be alarmed. Uh, don't be afraid. Um, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, uh, of Nazareth, he says, who was crucified, but he is risen. He is not here. Very clearly, this this figure is an angel. That's is you know this is the mo of what angels do. They look a certain way. He fits the description, and then angels simply announce things. They give messages. And the first thing that he does is he makes this amazing announcement that Christ, their Lord, had risen and was not there. He told the women or the women there to not just keep it to themselves, but go in to tell the disciples to hurry and go uh, to find Peter. They point out a particular who had denied Christ, but also the rest of the disciples uh, to tell them that he is risen and to prepare themselves for his appearing um, to the rest of them. So understandably, these women depart in awe. Now, at some later point in the day, um, at some or some later part, it, in that morning, it's also recorded that Jesus appeared first to Mary Magdalene, that she didn't just receive the announcement from the angel, but Christ himself revealed uh, or um, yeah, revealed himself to, to that particular Mary. Now, quick note, if you, if you read through your Bible or just thumbing through your phone and saw there like a few notes about verses 9, 10, and 11, you might have seen something that said, hey, this section is, is, is not contained in the earliest manuscripts. Um, and there are, there are legitimate questions about the authenticity of some of those, of like some of those verses, but that's not hidden from us. That's why it, it, it tells you in every copy, hey, this is, this is something that you need to consider. But I included it in our reading and we can, we can, um, we can take the authenticity of that part of the story at face value simply because that's not the only place that it's recorded. Um, in the book of John, he also he also describes this meeting between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene uh, confuses him for a gardener um, in that in that passage, and so taken you know taken that way, we can we can just run with it and go with it. Um, but there is one thing I want I want to point out that a lot of interpreters of this story do point out rightly, I think, and that is that it is very significant that these first encounters between the messenger, and then Christ himself, that, that he's revealed to women first is a big deal because it does lend to the reliability and the authenticity, again, of these accounts. It's the women who receive this honor in part because none of them abandoned the Lord like the men did during the crucifixion. 
Um, they stay steadfast in their devotion, and they even go out and spend their money, rush to the tomb without a way to get in in order to honor their Lord who they presume dead. And also, you have to, you just got to tell the story at face value. Um, there's, there's a certain um, cultural reality that I think that we, uh, at our worst misogynistic moments, can understand, is that it tells us at the very end of chapter 11 that when Mary goes to report these things, uh, the men don't believe it. <laughs> that the men don't, like the women's testimony is not necessarily um, considered reliable, both culturally and you see the, you see that, th that play out here, that it takes eventually Jesus, Jesus appearing to the disciples later um, for them to get it and believe it. And as many people have pointed out when telling the story, if you were, if you were trying to make the, to, uh, make the story as believable as possible, then you would not have used women as the first witnesses um, in that particular time. We're dealing with details of history. And when we harmonize this history with the rest of the gospel accounts, we get the full picture, a cohesive story um, that is well attested to that our Lord did indeed rise from the dead on Easter Sunday. But of course, Dealing with the raw pieces or with the raw reported facts of history is not all that we're concerned with. I mean, it's not just that these events happen, but the rest of the Bible will go on. And Jesus, throughout his ministry, was 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 describing uh, and, uh, and and giving us the meaning behind these events. That the Bible and the Christian faith doesn't just rely upon upon uh, the um, the reliability of reported accounts, but then also the interpretation of those accounts and the way in which we are to under, un, understand the history that has unfolded. So, and so the second thing I want us to see this morning is point number two, the resurrection interpreted. The resurrection interpreted. It's not fitting enough for us to just come to church on an Easter morning and hear the story without hearing, okay, what that story means for ourselves and for the whole world. What does this mean? What is the significance? Why has this become such a central thing? Why can the gospel be summarized in this notion of the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord? As you consider the Bible, the Bible has this way, this pattern of how it teaches us um, theology or how it teaches us and gives us uh, a religion to follow and to believe in. Over and over in the Bible, we see this pattern of of God acting in history, uh, that things like the resurrection tend to happen, that there are these great, uh, th uh, these great events, these acts of redemption that happen at a particular time and, and at a particular place. And the Bible describes such events. But then God doesn't stop there. He also then gives us revelation to help us understand and interpret those things that happen. We're not left to, to wonder to just, uh, to just rely on our conjecture or our assumptions. But he says, no, these things happen, and this is what it means. And we get that at work all the time. So we think about the exodus of Moses, for example. We don't just get the events that happen. Then we get, um, then we get the Bible telling us this is why it happened, and this is what it means. Here's the, here's the significance for the people of Israel and for us. I mean, that is what... That is what uh, um, what the Torah and the rest of the Old Testament is largely about is explicating these events that have happened. Whether you consider the flood narrative or um, the nation of Israel's conquest of the land or their exile, their return, on and on we have these stories of history that then the meaning gets interpreted for us. We never just deal with raw historical events. And so even a celebration of Easter should never just be a consideration of the bare historical event. Thankfully, though, in the rest of the New Testament, we have revelation from, um, from the Holy Spirit working through the apostles and the prophets, those eyewitnesses, describing for us how we are to understand the resurrection and what it means for us. And it happens early on. So, for example, the apostle Peter, right away, in the book of Acts, when he starts preaching, he talks about how um, how things, you know, how the resurrection and then Christ being exalted 
uh, at the right hand of the Father, that these things were done to give repentance to Israel and to give them the forgiveness of their sins. Elsewhere, Peter will say uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1, he says that, you know, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. John in the book of Revelation says that the resurrection of Christ secured his power over death and Hades. Paul in Romans says that if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And we can go on and we can go on citing these verses in uh, concerning the resurrection. But the basic point is, is this. The way that the resurrection is interpreted, the meaning behind it, the purpose for it, and, and the reason why we have to consider it today is that the resurrection is, um, uh, is enacted by God as a, as a source of proof, as a way of vindication, a way to, uh, to guarantee all of the things that Christ has secured for us in his salvation. Said a different way, it's like this. If it's though all the things that we attribute to Jesus Christ doing for us, dying for our sins, uh, shedding, his, shedding his, uh, his blood, promising us eternal life, uh, granting us this hope in being born again, um, these claims that Christ has conquered the evil one and he has overcome, uh, overcome death, even the idea that we will be rewarded by Christ uh, in a new creation, what the resurrection does for us is that it's as though God gives us a stamp or a seal of approval. That it's the guarantee that we hope for, that all of the hopes of our faith are proven true in the resurrection. That the resurrection is God's way of demonstrating to us um, that all that has been revealed is indeed true, and that our faith is not, in the end, in vain. The resurrection is the central piece of evidence for the hope that we have stored up uh, within us, and that any, uh, and that the beginning and end of our hopes in Christ are bound up in the vindication of the resurrection. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, he puts things this way, and he states it kind of negatively. He says, he says this, he says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead for, you know, for Christians? He says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. That our faith hinges on this reported event. He goes on to say, if Christ has not been raised and your faith is futile, then you, were, then you were also still in your sins. And those who have fallen asleep, meaning those who have, those who have died in this life, well, they truly have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, then we are of all people most to be pitied. That at the end of the day, without the resurrection, we truly are wasting our time on a good Sunday morning or it's a bit rainy but we can be just hanging out on the couch the central place of the resurrection isn't something that Christians have made up and put an emphasis on but this is what God has revealed what the scriptures testify to themselves we cannot understate the monumental consequence of the resurrection either happening or as Paul says, or not. This resurrection, though, embraced by the early church is what led Christ's early followers, who were, again, this Jewish group of people. It led them, and it affected their faith in their lives so much that they started to consider this resurrected Savior not just the man, but God himself. 
that forced his group of followers to change their significant day of worship and rest from a Saturday to a Sunday. That's how important it was. And by the time we reach the book of Revelation, uh, we do see the Apostle John um, giving special note, even given this special de designation, a title to Sunday, which we still use today, and that is the Lord's Day. But the resurrection is absolutely central. Oh. But it's not just central in this abstract way, um, in this grand way, but also as we consider it, we do have to consider the many ways in which it should have an impact on our individual lives and on the way in which we live out the faith and the way in which we hope um, in the future. So the last thing I want us to see is point number three, uh, is let us then keep the Easter feast. Let us keep the Easter feast. I want us to, for the rest of our time, get back to some of the practical implications for uh, Easter, the resurrection, and then how we can aid ourselves and aid one another in keeping that reality before us all the time, every day. Now, once again, as I mentioned, when you consider the way in which uh, the Bible works, there are often these acts of history, these great redemptive acts, meaning redemption, meaning when God saves people in a particular way. Um, and then the Bible talks about the history and then it interprets the history for us. And then there's also one other thing that tends to happen um, after something, after one of those historical events. Is not only does God interpret the event after it happens, but then he also instructs the people to do something and that's something, more often than not, is to keep a feast, <laughs> to turn it in a holiday, or to turn it into a holiday so that, that, so that it can help them in their remembrance. Most clearly in the Bible, if you think about the Jewish scriptures, if you think about the, the Torah and the story of the Exodus, um, that's the way the Feast of the Passover works. That God is doing this great work, um, that he is going to tell the people what it means and then to remember what it means and to build it into their bones, he gives them a feast to celebrate. He gives them the, the Passover meal. And this idea of the, of the people of God commemorating God's great acts of redemption, it's something that happens even, even I mean, far into, into Israel's history. I mean, even when you consider the book of, uh, of Esther, and how God returned the remnant of God's people from exile, well, that's then commemorated by what's known as the Feast of Purim, which, is, which, was, which we see come up in the New Testament. Or even think even later, think about something like Hanukkah. Um, what is Hanukkah? Well, Hanukkah is, is a celebration of what the people believe during intertestamental times, so between the Old and New Testaments, regarding, um, regarding the retaking of Jerusalem and the cleansing of the temple. So there was this time uh, before the Romans came that Jerusalem and the temple were under control by the Seleucid Empire, and there was a revolt, and the Jews won their freedom for a short amount of time, and they cleansed the temple from idolatry, and then that's where the Feast of Hanukkah came from. Well, it's not just the Israelites and the Jewish people who have been doing this. Um, Christians picked up the practice as well, and that practice led to what we regard today as the, as the church calendar, a recounting of the acts of redemption, in particular the acts of redemption that, um, that Christ completes. Now, we're, we are a Reformed church, so in one sense, we don't keep the calendar in the same way. We don't regard days like Easter as, as like a, um, as a required Holy Day. I mean, many of you will probably just, after this, go and hang out with family and not keep a proper uh, a religious feast. And we're not going to bring, we're not going to drop the hammer on you for doing something like that. Um, no, in the Reformed Church, extra events like the Good Friday service we had, they're they're helpful. They're not they're not holy requirements. We don't bind your conscience in a way to to make you do it. Um, they're not necessities these days and these seasons, but they are helpful. They are a way in which we as a community uh, can mark our time, can be 
can be formed together as a community. And the reason why I bring this all up is that it is good for us as a community and as a, as a people. Uh, it aids us in our reflection upon the resurrection to gather together, uh, to feast, uh, to take a holiday, um, and to build in this annual rhythm, this an annual way of life to refocus and remind us about what has been accomplished through the resurrection. I mean, hopefully we're people who try to practice thankfulness all the time. And yet there is something special about gathering together at Thanksgiving um, in order to help build that into us as a people. Um, now, many of us, you might be, I heard someone who was going to wear a uh, American flag set of pants this morning, but many of us are not so patriotic that it's the 4th of July every single day for us. I mean, you may be. Um, but no, for, for, for most of us, uh, the special patriotic feeling that comes in the 4th of July is, is more than enough to satisfy our, um, our interest. No, seasons and days for commemoration such as this, they are helpful because that's just simply the way humans operate. They're supplemental um, to our most central rhythm, which is the Lord's Day every single week on Sunday. Um, they never subvert that. But it is a day that is deserving. Of, and it, if there's any topic, right, if there's any event that happened, that it is deserving of extra recognition and a pause in life and a time to just focus in on it, this is that day. Once again, as Paul said, if there is no resurrection, we above all are to be pitied. <laughs> Last thing in terms of our consideration, and I hope this doesn't sound like a downer, like we're ending on a, on a bit of a downer. There is the question of, okay, well then how do we consider it? Um, what, how will, how will our lives change if we truly do consider the reality of the resurrection? What will it lead us to? Uh, if it is indeed true, then quite obviously uh, the resurrection should have major implications for every person in this room, for every person that has ever lived, for, for you and for me this morning. And the implication, I think, pretty clearly is this, that the resurrection requires us to live our lives, quorum Deo, before the face of God, clinging to that hope of being raised with Christ on the last day. The resurrection is important because it's not just Christ um, who has been raised, but the promise and the, the interpretation given is that, all, is that all those who are united to him will be raised with him on the last day. But that hope also places certain demands on our lives. To be united with Christ in the resurrection, um, to have this gaze set upon the hope of glory, uh, requires that we're going to store up all of our treasures and put all of our hopes and put all of our money down on that future. And by consequence, it's going to mean that we, are that we stay united to Christ in this life in a particular way as well. This is how Paul puts the dynamic of life for those who are hoping in the resurrection, for those who are, are, are banking on that for their future. This is how Paul puts your life in Romans chapter 6. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were also baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, then we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. What that simply means for us is that Easter is a call for great hope. Um, it is a time for us to place great faith in the life of the world to come and the hope of that, hope of that resurrection, being united with Christ then. 
But at the same time, it also reminds us that life now requires of us being united to him in his death. That the dynamic that Christ lays out through the Gospels of dying um, to yourself or losing your life so that you might find it, um, or the charge laid out by the apostles to take up your cross and Christ, take up your cross and to follow him, that that's what life has in store for us now. C.S. Lewis puts it once again this way. He says, because of the resurrection, there must be a real giving up now of the self. You must throw the self away blindly, so to speak. And the principle runs through all of life from top to bottom. Give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day, and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being, and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will ever really be yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself, and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, Rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ and you will find him. And with him, everything else thrown in. May our hope in the resurrection be so complete that we are able to look to Christ and lay down every part of our life um, in this in this world. May that be our ambition and our prayer and our goal as we refocus on the resurrection once again this Easter morning. Let's pray.